Good evening, folks. I'm Eddie Carson, and you are listening to Race Matters here at WJOPLP Newburyport Joppa Radio 96.3. We're here, and what we're going to talk about tonight in my solo performance titled Not Playing by the Rules. And I'm going to get delve into not playing by the rules here in uh, in a couple seconds. I do want to remind listeners, though, that anything shared, the views, the things that are expressed here, uh, are clearly a reflection of my opinions, my thoughts, which I believe are detail, well researched, scholarly, as I am a detail, highly opinionated, and highly scholarly person. And that's usually the case for my guests who come on board, too. So as we delve into this, I want to remind folks, right, we got a holiday coming up here pretty soon. And as we think about that holiday, it's the holiday oftentimes that goes invisible in this country. In many ways, it goes invisible much like when the enslaved in U.S. history were finally freed. And that happened, of course, on June 19th, 1965, when folks became fully aware of their emancipation put in place by President Abraham Lincoln. This weekend here in Newburyport, there are a lot of things going on, folks, and I, and I hope you will parade and engage and celebrate and congregate and bring joy and funk and energy the same way many of you embrace the 4th of July. And I'll spend some time really delving into that, but also connecting that to this linear history when it comes to political idolatry and the realities of not playing by the rules. A few things that are going to happen, though. Tomorrow, June 16th, down at City Hall, there's going to be the ceremonial Raising of the Juneteenth flag, there are a series of speakers who will be speaking for about an hour. Yours truly will be offering a call to action to folks in this area, but also a call to action to people beyond this area and who may get wind and message or messages of the things that need to transpire and need to happen, too. Those things are always good. On Saturday, Corey Harris is going to be performing a concert at the Belleville Meeting House. That's going to start at 8 o'clock p.m. Saturday, June the 18th. You get a chance. Come on out. Check it out. Celebrate Juneteenth Juneteenth, the way you would celebrate the 4th of July. This is a, a huge holiday for a brother like me. I've said for many years, which feels like centuries already, and I've told folks this on this show, I don't celebrate the 4th of July, and I have a number of reasons why I don't celebrate the 4th of July. If you've not heard that from me before, I suspect you'll come to a conclusion as to why that's the case, particularly in a what I would call indirect or an implicit, some folks will say there's nothing implicit about me, maybe I should use the word explicit manner as I delve into the narrative of not playing by the rules today. The YWCA of Greater Newburyport on Monday, June the 19th, they're going to be doing a number of things. There's going to be an ice cream, sh- a, a ice cream social, rope burners, an open swim in terms of the celebration that's going to happen here at the studio on Saturday, June 17th to June the 18th, starting at 6 o'clock a.m., and concluding at six o'clock, 18, 6 o'clock excuse me, a.m. on June 18th, we're going to be playing a number of black musical works. It's going to be a marathon festival as we get into the funk of black music, black artists, and how we celebrate the freedom of the enslaved. Folks who look like me, who talk like me, who sound like me, who walk like me, who think like me, come out to think about What does it mean to continue to fight for expression and freedom here in the 21st century? On Monday, things will come to a conclusion, as many of you will be off work 
And again, while you're off work, resting, engaging, reflecting, maybe you'll get the grill out. You'll cook some chicken. Maybe you'll have a little um, barbecue. We can talk about, have a little debate about, you know, what's considered a barbecue versus a cookout versus grilling. I was listening to that on another show a couple weeks ago, and I found a conversation to be quite interesting. I say all that to say, on Monday, June 19th, Juneteenth Day, the day that is now a national holiday, we're going to celebrate that day at the screening room here in Newburyport um, by showing the documentary film When Houston Had the Blues. And that's going to be super dope, particularly because at the end of the showing, yours truly will engage in a conversation, an interview with the director, Alan Sawyer, over that. So a lot of great stuff that's going to happen, and I'm looking forward to all those things that are there. You know, as we really navigate into this space here this evening, as we think about all the things that are going to transpire and that's going to happen over the weekend, we have to start reflecting on the realities of politics here in the United States. And because I'm a black man, one of the things that I've continued to share with my students and colleagues and folks for I don't know, a couple decades now, is the fact that if you are black, if you're queer, if you're a woman, if you're an immigrant, if you are a person of color, you've had to depend on the courts and legislative processes just to be seen as a citizen in this country. Because the reality, of course, is that the bedrock, the foundation of the United States was not designed for people like us. This is one of those things where we've had to campaign, lobby, and really show a sense of expression, but also delve into the dirty work of being political to illustrate the fact that we have a voice. We should be seen and we should be treated like the full citizens that we are. Those are the realities that are there. But yet, while this is happening here, I think about this notion of not playing by the rules. And if we were to look at this bedrock, this foundation of the United States, part of that is really has been promulgated by this notion of American values, the American Constitution, a document, an enlightened document of the Enlightenment period that really inculcated this sense of values expression, freedom. I love the fact that a lot of these documents going back to the Declaration of Independence and, of course, the U.S. Constitution really prescribe and subscribe to this inherent notion of all individuals. But yet, when they thought about all individuals, those all individuals really were cis white men. And if you didn't belong to that country club, you were inherently excluded for the fact that you're going to have to spend centuries and really even here today as we head towards Juneteenth campaigning for your voice while feeling a sense of reaction, pushback, resistance to the fact that we only want to be seen and we only want to be heard. And a lot of people would say that that has really been called, well, it's part of this modern day culture war that's underway. And the culture war is very, very real. It's something that is um, that's that's being expressed, particularly by the politics of American identity. The late great intellectual historian scholar Richard Hofstetter in his famed book Anti Intellectualism in America, we really dove into the problems that were starting to creep in, particularly before we even got to some of the ongoing political strife of folks disavowing, not allowing, essentially not permitting voices of those who, who have been really subscribed and called the minorities. And we think about that subscription of minority, which is, is a, is a it's an obsolete terminology. I'm not a minority. I'm BIPOC, 
black indigenous person of color, and there are many folks who are like me, but yet to use the phraseology minority is to deduce us into something that's small, less vocal, and not seen, and that narrative continues to play forward even here in the year 2023. So if we think about not playing by the rules, well, one of the things we have to think about is the fact that <coughs> understanding what's happening in the U.S. today is something fundamentally similar to what's happened elsewhere in other countries around the world, right? Because the idea is that the United States is different from other places, the different values, different expectations, greater freedom, greater livelihood that's there. Folks can find their sense of voice and identity here. It's somewhat a falsity. It's a, it's a, it's a failure in advertisement. It is a check that is still blanked and never got signed nor cashed in. And if we're gonna think about that particular way of framing the United States, I guess using a word such as unflinchingly is probably a better way of thinking about modern day politics when we think about the identities and the crucialness of so many folks. This term unflinchingly helps us not only diagnose the most dangerous policy steps that we're seeing today. And I'm just gonna go ahead and name, name it. And as I name those things, folks who are listening, who are chiming in, if you disagree with me, send me an email, reach out to me, feel free to say, hey, I wanna come on the show and have a conversation about things that you've said. I welcome that, particularly if you believe that there is a fact error in some of the content that I am demonstrating here. I am just going to go ahead and tell you, I take my work, my scholarship, my thinking about the, the plight of the 21st century very seriously. Thus, I'm not going to prescribe anything that's going to be a falsity whatsoever. But yet we think about the policy steps of the GOP, the grand old party, the Republican Party. The GOP is taking, well, I guess what we could truly appreciate as the gravity of the situation in which America has found itself in. And again, really this narrative of thinking about this Unflinchingly, unflinchingly characteristic of the modern day Republican Party. That really started a, a, a while ago. You know, I don't want to get into the whole full historical narrative of that. That's um, another sermon, maybe left for a, a Sunday morning or maybe one of my lectures or classes or whatever way you want to define it. But yet, we can't help but think about the term political realignment. I suspect many of you are very familiar with the word political realignment. I find it interesting when I hear Republicans in Congress, especially when they were looking to decide who was going to be the next Speaker of the House, there were, you know, not a lot of black Republicans in Congress. I'm always surprised that there are black Republicans, just to be honest with you. Again, just an opinion of mine. But hearing people talk about the fact that color doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, we should be colorblind, we should be race blind, we shouldn't really subscribe nor see things that way, and yet we think about policy issues that are taking place. Many of those things have been designed to undo some of the progress Black folks, queer folks, brown folks, all kind of folks who've been categorized into this framing called minority have had to wrestle with for a long period of time. You know, I mean, I think back if, if, if you know your U.S. history, and if you don't, you know, I'll give you some nuggets really to, to pick up and think about. You could always go purchase, buy a great book if you email me. I'm happy to give you a wonderful bibliography of great works that really delve into this. But when we think about political realignment, we think about, really, roughly around the time of the rise of FDR, as we get to the Great Depression, and as we get to some of his New Deal policies, one of the things that we start to see is the fact that many black Americans were exhausted from the experience of economic degradation and mistreatment, lynching by the KKK, restrictions by white Southerners in the Deep South who wouldn't allow us to really manifest ourselves in ways by which 
we would become full citizens. Black folks start migrating to the north. You've probably heard this term before called the Great Migration. They move to cities such as Detroit, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Baltimore, for example. Um, many would even migrate up to Harlem. Some would make their way to Boston. Not many, but some would make their way. And the goal, of course, was to escape the persecution, persecution experience living in the deep south in this country. You know, so that started to happen. And really what they're looking to do is really think about, you know, how might their life be better than living in the agrarian rural south? though we start to see more cities, right? They call it rural and agrarian, maybe a bit of a falsity too. Uh, that's probably more antebellum language that I'm using um, more than anything else. And so as we see this migration pattern starting to transpire, what happens is that the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party was engaged in a lot of the malicious vicious actions that were happening to black folks in the American South. They're the ones who would not pass anti-lynching legislation. Woodrow Wilson, a Democratic president, refused to really engage in those kind of discussions there. And so they start doing this and, and Democrats started thinking, hey, we need to make more of an appeal to black folks, mainly to gain greater political power. When we think about Democrats, that hasn't changed a lot when it comes to the relationship with black folks. A lot of people would say that, you know, black people are, 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 are stuck between a rock and, I don't know, a hard place or another rock, whatever that phraseology may be, in a sense that we can't vote nor support Republicans as historically black people have voted for Democrats especially, you know, going back to the 1960s, you know, 90% or greater, right? Once we were able to really ascertain the franchise and we could vote. Democrats start recognizing that, hey, we have all of these black folks who've moved into urban areas like Chicago, for example, and Philadelphia, as I already mentioned. We need to work with them to empower them in a way that maybe they will start voting for us. And that really started to kind of change the narrative quite a bit, right? We start to see the fact that 1960s, JFK, who was a, real, a little reluctant, to be honest with you, towards civil rights initiatives, and LBJ, who both JFK and LBJ had to be pushed to action, particularly by brother Martin Luther King Jr. We're going into the 70s, right? We, by the time we get to the 1970s, we're going to see kind of a, 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 a shift, this notion of law and order that you hear former American President Donald Trump use to talk about the fact that we're going to clamp down on riots and protests and the fact that queer folks, women, black folks are marching and demanding for greater rights as they seek to evolve through an evolutionary or better yet even a revolutionary process in this American identity. A real hard shift started to transpire, though. By the time we got to the end of the 70s, into the election of 1980, when Ronald Reagan, who was the GOP nominated and, of course, who became a two-term president of the United States, really sought to disavow some of the civil rights and some of the actions that were made by black folks, even to a point where Reagan did not embrace adopting Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the nation's history. And of course, we know that two states that are going to hold off, hold heartily in pushing for that change are going to be Arizona and here in New England, New Hampshire. And they're going to hold off. But yet by that point, though, black folks have become cemented within the Democratic Party, a party that in many ways had persecuted, had lynched, and had essentially created a number of laws to keep black folks from getting to the voting booth. But yet what happens in this political realignment is that the Republican Party of today is really the Democratic Party of the past that operated and worked to persecute black and brown people. 
We are suffering from the same, what I would call, rot that has brought down democracy in other countries. And that idea and that issue is really taking place here in the United States in so many ways. People think, well, those are things that happen in other places, never here in the U.S., but that's a misguided way of looking at the political contentiousness and the fact that people can say, we just need to have civil conversations. We need to engage in a way in which we can talk about our differences, but yet that's easy to say, especially if you're white and male and Christian, well, and, and, and straight for that matter. If you're black, brown, queer, female, it's a, no, a whole other entity by which we need to think about what does democracy mean? And some people push back and say, well, come on, Brother Carson, the United States was never really founded on the principles of democracy. The construction of the Constitution wasn't even a democratic process that came into play. It excluded large populations of folks from being a part of the American polity. When we think about the grand old party, the GOP, the Republican Party, it has, as a party, decided it no longer wants to play by the rules. And that would instead prefer to rule as authoritarians rather than share power with opponents. Of course, this idea, of course, is let's disavow this notion of shared power. Let's move forward and let's do what we can by cementing authoritarian tactics by pitting people against each other over the values that people say are fully wholehearted American values that should be as common as apple pie, as baseball, as an American hot dog, I guess. Those things have really become somewhat debunked. Former President Donald Trump, who tried to steal the 2020 election, recently, after being arrested, for stealing government documents that, let's just be honest, I don't care what color you are, I don't care what your sexual orientation is, I don't care what, you know, what your gender is, if it was you, you would be arrested. And no one would be defending you. Even if you are the most loyal Trump supporter, you're going to go to jail. Just ask all of the folks who showed up on January the 6th because Donald Trump gave that command. They are in jail, and he is not. He's continued to pass law, not pass laws, but um, really advance lies about the 2020 election. Recently, he held a rally, really a campaign rally, over the fact that he was arrested, right? Remember, this brother was indicted multiple times, impeached, which is the same thing as an indictment, twice, that President Joe Biden and his band of misfits are Marxist, communists, and fascists who interfered in a 2020 election. And essentially, they're operating as fascists in mounting a political campaign against Donald Trump. He also falsely instead insisted that he had the right to keep secret documents. Those were his documents, and they were not the property of the United States government. Remember now, these are documents that have all kind of war stuff, missile stuff, you know, plans for other countries, and he alone is a safeguard to put his boxes of government files stacked up in his bathroom and, and hidden away in other corners of, um, of his um, Florida home. Donald Trump stated, I quote, Today we witness the most evil and corrupt abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch. <laughs> Just think about that. Very sad. I, I won't go into uh, any more uh, analysis of that. A corrupt sitting president had his top political opponents arrested on fake, here we go with the fake news, and fabricated charges in which he, Joe Biden, and numerous other presidents would be guilty right in the middle of a presidential election in which he's losing very badly. 
I, and I don't know about the losing part, particularly seeing that I, I think his poll numbers are actually up a, a little bit. And um, the election season is about to start, but it hasn't really got going anywhere near the particular position that Donald Trump is subscribing. And yet, in this campaign to attack folks as communists, there are communists in this country. They have the right to be communists, right? Last time I checked, communists were actually advocating for the plight and the hopes of black and brown and queer folks and women. But yet, fascists persecute those same populations that I just mentioned before. And so how do we really engage and really think about this dynamic of the culture war? We pit Americans against Americans, especially over issues of identity. A word that people like to throw around quite a bit, and it's one that I'm, you know, I'm not fond of, but yet there's a reality to that is identity politics. And identity politics is a reality, and it has to be real, particularly when you think about the fact that Women, queer folks, black, brown, Asians, indigenous folks, they had to protest, they had to march, they had to go to Congress, right, to get legislative processes passed, they had to challenge outdated or non-existing laws that persecuted them in order for them to be seen and to have a voice. All of those things to challenge the American consciousness, the American spirit of what does it mean to be American, a lot of these things have been folded over the last few years over things such as critical race theory and how we shouldn't talk about race in schools and classes. The fact that when we talk about critical race theory, it's designed to make white people feel bad about themselves. Folks marching into schools and into libraries. Did you think about this, right? This is what fascism has done in the past. To remove books they say are inappropriate to the identities of kids of other grown folks and thinking about this. And really, it's had a huge impact, especially since the summer of 2020, when we saw a lot of white folks rally behind the, um, behind the movement towards racial justice, only to quickly become fatigued and tired of it. A Pew research recently, a Pew, the Pew Research, Recently, in a survey, found that 51% of Americans say they strongly or somewhat support Black Lives Matter. 51%. That's down from over 70% of Americans who express support for the movement, again, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. And again, that number was roughly around 56% last year. Again, that's according to the Pew Research Center. Think about that coming down. That means this is not just a, a red and a blue, a conservative and a liberal thing. What you're finding here is a nation that is really in a divisive stage of the most ubiquitous element that kind of defines the confines of American identity, which is race. And racism is very real. Racism is real to a point where one of my favorite quotes, and I saw someone years ago and you may recall this drop a banner over the green monster at Fenway Park during a Red Sox game that stated, racism is as American as apple pie. The study indicates the decrease is mostly a result of a declining share of white people who say they, that they support the movement, right? I mean, that, that, that's really starting with white people, and that's where I, this, this ubiquitous element really comes back down to race. The overall number of black and Latinx, Latinx folks express support and have stayed essentially in the same path towards the fact that they recognize black lives do matter. The black lives matter is necessary, especially as we've seen recent incidents continue with police brutality and the fact that, and think about this folks, as we think about this idea of American identity, I am not allowed, if I'm lost, if I have car trouble, I am not allowed to go knock on someone's door and ask for help. I am not allowed to do that. There is a real reality that harm could come my way. 
because the first thing they'll do is they'll see my skin color. And again, we do notice race. And that's something that's important. Again, right, I'm taking a couple exceptional examples and really kind of exploring them, knowing that most people don't behave and do that. The same way that most cops don't behave in manners that bring harm to black and brown folks. But yet when there's a real risk, you have to subscribe to a notion that there is a legitimate fear here in the 21st century that has never really subsided as we escape the period known as Jim Crow. I think about that and I think about what my wife once said. She said, we should put a sign outside of our home that says, don't shoot. If there's an incident, my husband is black. And she said that and not even jokingly by the fact that this will bring awareness that if they see me, I'm not bringing harm. I live there. If I go up to a stranger's door who's not my neighbor, because I have great neighbors, I have outstanding neighbors, I have awesome white neighbors um, who are wonderful human beings, but yet for the folks who don't know me, may only draw conclusions based off my race. And a lot of those conclusions have been predicated over centuries of the falsities of poor teaching about the role that race and racism plays in this country. 81% of black folks said they vehemently support the Black Lives Matter movement, while 63% of Asian folks and 61% of Latinx Hispanic folks said that they also vehemently support it. That is compared to 42% of white folks. That's all white folks, right? So that means that's liberal conservative Republican, Democrat, all buy into that. 84% of Democrats and Democratic-leaning folks support Black Lives Matter here in the 21st century. That's compared with 82% of Republicans, of folks who identify as members of the GOP as being in diametrical opposition to the Black Lives Matter movement. We've continued to see this furthered by the campaign against the biological rights of women as we've seen the rise of the Republican Party through the Supreme Court and congressional legislation take aim against women and their own reproductive functionalities. Men making these decisions, white men making these decisions, right? So again, black folks who, Asian folks, Latinx, Hispanic folks, women, queer folks, all of the folks who were knocking on a door, who were protesting, campaigning to be seen and to have a voice, only to be told that we're going to operate in this sense of law and order, as Richard Nixon, Nixon put in place going back to his 1968 presidential campaign. And of course, we know one of the most criminalized presidents ever in Donald Trump engages in its notions of law and order. But yet, when you have a Republican Party not playing by the same rule, notions are you change the rules, you tweak the rules, and you do it in a way that furthers the oppression of people who are looking to celebrate Juneteenth, who are looking to enjoy a June month in which we celebrate pride for all those folks who identify as LGBTQ+. See, when that happens, many of you, I suspect have studied authoritarianism, but yet the problem of studying authoritarianism is that we get glued that authoritarianism only exists in places like China. Or better yet, let's go back to fascist regimes such as Germany and Italy between World War I and World War II, and of course during World War II as well, right? We subscribe to those things. But yet when we think about autocracies, ruling parties become personal tools of the leader and loyalty to the head of state, right? Does that sound familiar? Rather than expertise is the most prized political element. Those loyalty elements demand surge and really kind of to coalesce behind a common cause when joined with that leader, that supreme leader. And when that happens, you create what's known as the cult of personalities. We've seen that with Benito Mussolini. We've seen that with 
Joseph Stalin of Russia. We've seen that, of course, with Adolf Hitler, this cult of personality where people become, they can no longer hear the messages that are taking place. Donald Trump's ex-wife, and again, and I'm only stating what she stated, right? So I, I can't verify this, but you're free to look it up and explore this more if you would like, stated that over the years, you know, Donald Trump was obsessed with the speeches of Adolf Hitler. And I, when, I, when, I, when I read that and when I heard that, it reminded me of the fact that Adolf Hitler used to sit in mirrors, not mirrors, excuse me, he used to have someone take pictures of him, photos of him, by which he was giving gestures and performing and thinking about the greatest and the best way to engage and get a rise out of folks to follow him. Because, see, much like Donald Trump accusing Biden as being a fascist, leading America towards being a fascist nation, using the Justice Department as if it was the Gestapo, We've seen some of those same ventures happen even in the past. Book burning. Folks who were not Aryan. Queer folks. Those who were not able body. Those who were intellectually challenged. Were seen as not a part of the country and lesser than, thus denying those rights. We've seen in recent times too, right? These things happen here, but yet we've also seen those things happen in other countries. I like to think of, um, of, of Turkey's president, Erdogan, who once elected, really came into power and then used his power to push for purges, to remove folks, mayors and judges, really to expand his power. And my fear, my concern, of course, is people look at this as being another country problem, and yet they don't ponder, nor do they really reflect and think about how this is a part of the American identity, because now we're operating by different rules according to the GOP. And these are the rules that they put in place. You know, even in a, a democratic context, when an autocratic-minded leader is under investigation, loyalty becomes paramount, and the party's time and resources are channeled into defending that leader. Party functionaries portray the leader as a victim. They profess that there's been this witch hunt that has transpired. They really engage in a campaign and we've seen this historically, right, of smear campaigning journalists really thinking about things such as fake news. And that has been long been the history of the Italian political system, particularly going back to the period of Mussolini. I mean, you're talking about an individual in Donald Trump who was impeached twice, operating off the function and campaign off the big lies, right? Because we know that both Mussolini and Hitler used notions of the big lie to really get people to buy into it. The more and more and more you tell a lie, the more and more and more people start to believe it. The big lie, which claims that, of course, Trump, not Joe Biden, won the 2020 election, is an outgrowth of these authoritarian party dynamics in which most folks who subscribe to being in the GOP, especially those elected, claim that the election was stolen. That becomes the element. When we think about not playing by the rules, autocrats have long encouraged the lawless and corrupt to populate party and state institutions. You know, and again, I can't say more, and I get tired of talking about folks like Mussolini and Adolf Hitler because we subscribe them as being people of the past, or those are other problems that exist. But yet, keep in mind, it was journalists who became concerned about the problems that were happening in Germany. They started really publishing and writing articles. They started sounding the alarm bell that we have a problem. And yet people operated in, lives, in their lives to think, well, that's not my problem, so I won't engage in those things. I'll let someone else deal with this. And yet 
by the time folks recognized what was going on, it was too late because much like we're starting to see people disavow the fact that black lives do matter and we do have a crisis in this country, queer lives do matter because folks' identity is important. The plight and the voice of women do matter. We are at a particular point where we're marching into schools and into libraries and we're removing books. We're taking things out because people shouldn't read those things because they don't subscribe to our beliefs, which is somewhat of an, not even somewhat, which is authoritarian. Amanda Gorman's, <laughs> and I suspect everyone has heard this, her, um, her poem, for example, at the Biden inauguration, has now been removed from elementary school kids to read to more older kids to read, right? A book, or a poem, I should say, but it is lengthy, and if you haven't read it, really take time to either listen to it, it's on YouTube, um, or pick it up and read it, is really about giving folks hope and promise and seeing the fact that young kids can see themselves through the identities of other folks too. These things become problematic and challenges, and not even just at the national level. When we talk about local and state elements, especially local and state GOP politicians, they've had a long tie with extremist groups. Again, these are all factual things, things that can be substantiated, and things that I need you to pay attention to because much like the Lutheran minister Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died at the age of 39 for challenging Nazis, 39, right? The same age that Brother Martin Luther King was also assassinated, right? We're seeing the fact that journalists are pointing out the problems. These GOP folks at the state level are subscribing to some of the most extremist groups that are out there. You know, a couple examples here, you know, in states like Colorado and Oregon, for example, there are Republican officials that have used members of militia groups as security for public events. Think about that. Using militia, extremists, hate groups as security for public events. Now these extremists increasingly are really part of the party fold. And that's what happened when extremism comes into fruition. A 2022 study counted that one in five GOP state and local officials affiliated with hate groups such as the Oath Keepers. Remember now, the Oath Keepers who were largely engaged in the campaign to support Donald Trump in overthrowing the 2020 election by seizing the Capitol building on January the 6th. You know, Republicans have normalized authoritarian party dynamics to an extent that other autocratic mind leaders, you know, Ron DeSantis down in Florida, could easily step in. This is not a Donald Trump issue. It's almost like a handbook on how to do it because you are now appealing to a population of people that have now bought into the fact that this is what America should look like. America should look more like me. And if me means cis, white, straight, Christian, well, that's part of that Christian nationalism. Marjorie Taylor Greene, congressperson down at Georgia, has subscribed to the fact that she is a Christian nationalist. Donald Trump calls himself a nationalist. It is important that people understand that there's a difference in celebrating the 4th of July, if that's what you do, and being patriotic, or Memorial Day, than being a nationalist. Nationalists are bad in all shapes, forms, and fashions, right? Whether you're a black nationalist, that's a dangerous and that is a bad thing. Black nationalists who subscribe to that, um, that type of engaged bigotry is problematic though those black folks don't have any real type of dynamic nor power. White nationalists, problematic, and that dynamic is problematic too. And so we're at this point now where I think it's common to call this GOP behavior anti-democratic, but the description can only go so far. It tells us why they're moving America away, but not where it should go. And the contentiousness, right, that we can debate and we can have a lot of discussions on is that has this always been the fabric and a fold of the American consciousness? And remember now, Jim Crow didn't officially end until 1965. When I was in junior high, middle school, 
in the um, late 80s, early 90s, for example, we still had segregated proms, or better yet, segregated prom kings and queens, right? Busing still existed. Busing still exists in a lot of areas, mainly because there's this constant sense of white flight and people moving out in different ways. Of course, the United States is different in many important respects from a place like, I don't know, Hungary, for example. One important difference, we do have a decentralized electoral system. And it is safe to say, and I do want to highlight and illuminate this, that that decentralized electoral system did in many ways allow the 2020 election to not be stolen, right? And again, a shout out to Republicans in the state of Georgia who pushed back against Donald Trump saying that we cannot violate our constitutional oath by handing you something you did not win. The U.S. Constitution, the devolved election administration to states, giving local legislators control over the rules around elections and the processes of actually tallying the votes. Yet, this is where it comes down to the fact that if it's not authoritarian, central, and I control it, then dead people were voting. People stuffed the ballot box. The election was a fraud because we don't have all the power actors there. And yet, in those places where some of those claims were made, Arizona, for example, Georgia, these were Republican-controlled states. So I do want to be clear on that. The infrastructure of democracy is something we need to think about. And whether or not that infrastructure of democracy here in the United States has really ever been a stable entity, especially by the fact that there are folks like me who are knocking on a door, folks like others screaming to make sure we're heard and that our voice have some type of resolution in terms of our state of being and us being present here as well. You know, as we think about this and we think about this historical element that drives these things, we have to think about The fact that, you know, Jim Crow comes to an end in 1965. Black folks are going to enter into the 70s, into the 80s, really under a whole slew of economic degradation. This crack campaign started to pollute our communities in the 80s. It became a criminal issue, not a health issue. Here in the 21st century, as we think about opioids, it is now a health issue as it should be but not a criminal issue. Flipping of the coins when we think about race and really the fact that we go back to Juneteenth as the enslaved black folks were freed or notified of their freedom down in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1965, they navigate through a short period by which they enter into Jim Crow and through that period they escape still dealing with persecutions that's there. And those things become challenging. As I, it brings us to an end when we think about this whole issue of the party rules and what does that mean, particularly subscribing to and thinking about the GOP today. I want to mention a, a quote by Jack Garvey. Jack Garvey wrote a wonderful article titled Victory of the Vanquished. And Jack Garvey, I quote, states, We can reach back further yet. From an allegorical commentary on revolutions in Europe, most notably France, in Herman Melville's novel, Marty, published 12 years before the Civil War, he goes on to state, I quote, those there were who rejoiced that kings were cast down, but mourned. They were mourned in that the people themselves stood not firmer. A victory turned to no wise and enduring account said they is no victory at all. Some victories revert to the vanquished. And that is where we are as we really start to wrestle with the fact that like many folks, I am sounding the alarm bells for folks to start paying attention to the fact that when you start removing books, when you start to silence the identities of folks, when you start to decide what America should be and what it should look like because there's this 
growing white anxiety that got Donald Trump elected and put the Republican Party in a position they're in regarding, I don't know, I want to say the year 2044. I think it may be a little sooner than that, maybe 42, 43. White people in this country, for the very first time, will now be the minority. But yet, even then, we know they will not be the minority, primarily because they will still hold economic wealth and power in the way those rules of distribution tends to happen. Folks, I hope that you're working with me and thinking about this and thinking about how some parties are not playing by the rules. And because they're not playing by the rules, it makes it hard for folks who are not a part of the identities they believe should represent what American values look like, but can continue to be suppressed, oppressed, and have to live in a constant state of fear. And that constant state of fear is driven by notions of fascism that tend to take place. You're listening to Race Matters today. I'm Eddie Carson. This is WJOPLP Newburyport Joppa Radio 96.3. Thanks for congregating with the Soul Brother. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Again, if you find yourself struggling with something that I said, or you'd like to come on board and have a conversation with me, even if you don't want to come on a show and have a conversation with me, reach out to me. We'll have a cup of coffee, and we'll dive into why I think this country has a problem. And that problem is a reality that we must think about more and more and more. Thank you, folks. Happy Juneteenth.